Tonight's talk is about cuttings. The focus will be on softwood and semi-hardwood cuttings, but we're going to look at other types of propagation as well. So there are two main ways to propagate plants, either seeds or vegetative. What are the differences between those two? When we use seeds, we're taking parts of two different plants and mixing them together to make those seeds. So genetically, every offspring, every seed that germinates is going to be different than the parents. When we do vegetative propagation, the offspring is exactly the same as the parents. Growing things from seeds generally is slower and vegetative is faster. The advantage of seeds though is that I can do a large number. So I can do 100 acres of corn and propagate corn plants from seeds but to try and create 100 acres worth of corn plants from vegetative sources is, is a lot more difficult. Another advantage of seeds is that the seeds tend to be viable for a very long period of time, and many seeds can be stored at low temperatures for hundreds of years. You can't do that with vegetative material. Most of it has to be collected and processed right away. Seeds can be done at any time of the year, uh, but vegetative propagation has to be done at a certain time of year. Now that will depend on the plant, but sometimes this can be quite critical. Here's four common ways to do vegetative propagation. Division, suckering, layering, and cuttings. We're going to have a quick look at the first three, and then we're going to spend most of tonight looking at the cuttings. Division. This is used mostly for perennials, and it's generally done in the spring and fall when plants aren't actively growing. It's not suitable for most trees and shrubs. Even perennials that have tap roots can be difficult to propagate because in order to split a plant in half, we have to cut that tap root in half, and some plants will just die if you do that. There's also a group of plants called subshrubs. These are things like lavender and Russian sage. They grow more like shrubs, but we treat them like perennials in the garden. Those can be difficult to divide. Division is pretty simple. Most people will dig up the clump of plants and just use a spade or shovel to cut it into pieces and then plant each piece. It's simple as that. I like to do it a little differently. I like to leave the perennial in the ground and I split it in the ground and only remove Part of it. The part that remains has very little root damage and recovers much quicker that way. Here's some divisions from a hosta plant. You can dig these up and split them into any number of plants, but it's generally a good idea to leave the clump a certain size. Don't make it too small. It just takes too long for that clump to look good in the garden, and in some cases it takes a couple years for it to flower if you make the clump too small. So it's a good idea to take a good sized clump and cut it into two or three pieces and end up with three larger plants than a whole bunch of small ones. This is an old peony root. It looks very congested, and you could cut this in a number of different ways, but the red lines show three possible splits here. It's important that each section ends up with some of the roots and some of the new buds. That way that plant will grow again. Peonies are a good example of a plant that will come back and flower fairly quickly after division, provided you leave the divisions quite large. Another way to propagate plants is with suckering, and this works very well with some perennials, particularly the ones that spread a lot, because the way they spread is by making little runners underground, and you can simply cut those runners and transplant the new growths. It also works with quite a few shrubs, but not all of them. It's generally done in spring and fall. Again, it's easier on the plant if the plant's not actively growing. In midsummer, when the plants are growing and it's hot and things are dry, all of these propagation techniques are a little more difficult to do. A sucker is an underground growth from the plant, and it generally runs underground a certain distance and then grows up and makes a new stem. Then it'll grow underground again, make a new stem. And you could cut these up so that each vertical growth is its own plant. Once that runner has roots all the way along the runner, it can be cut into any number of small pieces, and it's pretty easy to do. 
Here's a picture of an old lilac, and you can see the stem behind the shovel, how big that is and how thick it is. And it's made some suckers coming out the side here. Now with things like lilac, you never know if these suckers actually have roots. The underground stem may go all the way back to the mother plant and have no roots on it. So the best thing to do is to dig around a little bit and have a look at it. If the new growth has roots, simply cut it off from the mother plant, pot it up, and you have a new plant. Plants that don't make their own runners can be propagated using layers. This is a process where we force a branch into the ground where it'll root. This works with almost all shrubs. It can be done at any time of the year. Uh, spring's a good time, but what I tend to do is I'm walking around the garden and whenever I see a plant that I want to propagate, I just start the layering process. And it doesn't really matter what time of year it is. It's a slow process, so this is going to take anywhere from six months to a year in our colder climate. could be faster in a warmer climate. It's also a good way to move old shrubs. If you have a large shrub, trying to dig that up and move it to a new location is really harmful for that shrub. You're going to lose most of the roots. You're going to get a lot of die back. Plus, it's a lot of work. So what I tend to do with those is do some layering, get some new growths going, move those, and then just dig out and get rid of the old plant. Not worth moving. Here's a diagram from my book, Plant Science for Gardeners. It shows how the technique is done. Find the point where the branch will touch the soil and then damage the stem a little bit. You can use a knife and just scrape on it. Or actually, I use my succotors and just scrape the bark a little bit. That will help the roots form at that point. And what I like to do is just dig it into the soil about half an inch and put a rock on top and then just leave it. I'm not in a big hurry. I can wait a year for this to root. A year later, you come back, you take the rock away. Under the rock will be a bunch of roots and you simply cut the piece off and move it to where you want. Layering can also be done above ground. And uh, this is done more for house plants, I think, than plants in the garden, but it should work for plants in the garden as well. You strip away some of the bark at a certain spot on the branch, get something wet like peat moss or soil or a mixture of the two, wrap it around the cut point, wrap that in some sort of plastic, cellophane, something like that. We want to keep this nice and moist. And we just leave it like that for a couple months. Then come back, open it up, and see if there's some roots. If you do have some new roots growing, you can now cut this branch below the roots and take the tip away and plant it up. It's a very simple technique. All right, now let's look at the cutting. But what is a cutting? Well, in this diagram, we're showing you rose cuttings. But a cutting is a piece of stem that you take off the plant. And when you've taken the cutting, there are no roots. So we have to treat the stem to grow new roots. And once it grows roots, then the new growth, the new bud will start growing on the plant. The key to all cuttings is to get those roots to grow. And it turns out that every plant has a certain degree of ability to grow roots. In some cases, it's zero. So if you go to a pine tree and take a cutting, it's probably not going to root for you. They're really, really difficult to root. Yet you could go to a willow tree, take a cutting, stick it in the ground, don't do anything, and it probably will root for you. So there's a wide range of ability to make roots, and it's sometimes difficult to know how easy that is, so you just have to try it. Now, a lot of beginning gardeners, they like to root things in water, and that works really well for some house plants. Uh, here are some coleus plants, and you can take a piece of that and stick it in water, and they root pretty easily. Uh, a lot of house plants root this way as well. It's a fairly good technique. It's nice in that you can see what's going on with the root system. You can do it in the home very easily. You don't need anything except an old jar. The problem with doing it this way is that the plant develops a different kind of root in water than it does in soil. So now when I take this rooted cutting out of the water and move it to soil, it's generally set back quite a bit. And the plant has to grow new roots to get growing in the soil. So in many cases, it's better to start them in the soil right away. 
the water technique also doesn't work for most woodies. So trees and shrubs don't really root well in water. Again, the willow is an exception. They'll root in just about anything. There are other types of cuttings, and a very common one is a leaf cutting. Now, this doesn't work with a lot of plants, but there are certain plants that work really well with this. The pictures here are showing streptocarpus, and this same technique works very well for a number of different house plants, including African violets. So what we've done in the picture on the left here is just taken a piece of leaf and stuck it in some soil, kept it moist, and weighed it. Early on in the process, the leaf starts growing roots, as pictured on the right side. And then once the roots are growing, that leaf will make tiny little baby plants along the top of the roots. We generally don't dig it up at that point. We leave it a bit longer until it looks like the picture on the left. And now we have larger leaves. Now we can come along and split that up into about a dozen little plants. Once each leaf has a root, it will grow on its own and become a complete mature plant. Leaf cuttings are easy to do, but they don't work on most plants. On some plants, though, leaf cuttings are extremely easy to do. So most succulents will make new growth at the base of their leaves quite easily. This is a jade plant, and the person has laid those leaves on some wet soil, and they'll root and make a new plant. You could take that leaf and just leave it on your desk and it will do the same thing. It hardly needs any moisture at all. The moisture in that succulent leaf is enough for it to make roots and start growing a small baby plant. Again, the technique works great on some plants, but doesn't work on most plants. For plants that are a little more difficult to propagate, we generally take stem cut or what I will just call cuttings. Many plants can be grown from stem cuttings. Most shrubs will work just fine. Some trees also work, but not all trees. Or in some cases, the trees will work, but the chances of success are pretty small. So if you did 10 cuttings, you might only get one that actually roots. Some evergreens are quite tricky to do, so pines and spruce are really hard. On the other hand, things like yews are extremely easy to propagate. The process takes several months, the cutting will just sit there for a month or two before it even starts making roots. Once the roots form, then it starts making a little shoot. And at that point, you have a plant that you could pot up. The process sounds a little difficult, but it's actually easier than you think. And a lot of descriptions of this process talk about misting systems and greenhouses and so on. You don't need a lot of that. In fact, I'm going to show you a technique today that anybody can do with a little bit of leftover garbage. But let's be realistic about this process. Every plant is different. And that's one of the things that makes it a little more complicated. Until you've done a plant, you don't know how easy it is. The timing could be critical on those plants. Some plants need a hormone. Other plants don't need a hormone. But the hormone may help speed up the process. But if you're interested in propagating plants, don't let these things stop you. It's actually easier than it sounds. All right, let's take a step back and ask a simple question. Why would a stem of a plant make roots? How does this whole thing start? I mean, roots normally grow at the bottom of a plant. And here we are, we've taken a stem from way up at the top of the plant, and somehow we expect to get roots. And in fact, we do get roots. How does that happen? Well, when we look at plants, they have special cells called meristem cells. These are cells that are undifferentiated. They don't know what they're going to be. That cell can turn into roots, leaves, stems, flowers, anything. As long as it's still undifferentiated, it doesn't know what it's going to be. And this is one thing that's fairly unique for plants, is they have a number of different types of meristems in various places. And that's one of the reasons they can be propagated so easily. So at the very tip of every root is a bunch of root meristems. Now those will normally turn into more roots, and that's how roots get longer. At the very top of the plant, we have something called the shoot meristem. And these are cells that are undifferentiated, and they can become stems or leaves or fruits, flowers. What they actually turn into depends on where they're located on the plant and how the plant is growing. 
between each leaf and the main stem, we have something called a dormant bud. That also has Mary stems in it, and that's an area that can turn into other types of tissue, particularly roots. So roots can actually grow where those dormant buds are because it has Mary stem cells there. The fourth place we find Mary stems is actually in the stem itself. Normally, these Mary stems allow the stem to get thicker and thicker as it gets older. That's why a tree ends up getting nice and thick and creates bark. And they have Mary stem cells in there that change into whatever type of cell the plant needs. Those can also turn into roots in some plants. When we're doing cuttings, we're taking advantage of the fact that plants have Mary stem cells in various spots and those Mary stem cells can turn into roots. To understand cuttings, we have to understand a difference between softwood and hardwood cuttings. And in fact, there's actually three. There's a softwood, semi-hardwood, and hardwood. And the semi-hardwood is kind of halfway between the other two. So here's a comparison between softwood and hardwood. Softwood is the young growth. So that's what we have early on in the spring. That's all softwood. And during the summer, that softwood slowly ages and becomes hardwood. In colder climates, that's absolutely necessary to get ready for winter. But even in warmer climates, plants tend to harden off the wood. It becomes stiffer and more vertical, and it holds up the plant better. So some of the differences here is that the color changes. So early in the year, those stems are nice and green. They slowly turn into a brown. The stem also gets stiffer as it gets older. And as the summer goes along, those stems get thicker and thicker. Now, which one of these is better for making cuttings? Well, it depends. There are some plants that root better as hardwood cuttings. Others root better as softwood cuttings. In some, the semi-hardwood works the best. For the gardener, softwood and semi-hardwood is the easier one to use. And that's the one we're going to look at. Hardwood cuttings are much harder to do and would be done outside over the winter. Here's an example of softwood. So this is the very tip of a lilac growth. And you can see that I'm bending it around. And in fact, some of these are so soft, you can actually tie a knot in them. Others you can bend quite well, but they will snap at some point. But the point here is that the stem is quite soft. By the end of the summer, this same stem will be quite stiff and you won't be able to bend it like this. And that's one way to know when you're looking at a plant, whether this is softwood or hardwood. Here's some pictures that will help. The ones on the left are semi-hardwood. So they're not the first growth, but they're sort of midsummer growth. They're getting a little stiffer. They're still green. They're kind of in that in-between stage. The ones on the right are hardwood. So now we're looking at the same kind of stem later on in the summer or fall. And it's getting brown. You start seeing the bark ridges on it. It's getting very stiff and they tend to be thicker at that point as well. Now, if we go back to our lilac growth, this is what a stem looks like around the middle of the summer. We have the lower part of the stem is already semi-hardwood. You can see that it's getting a little browner, but at the far right, we have softwood. This stem is still growing, and the piece at the left side is close to the trunk, and that grew in spring and then it continued to grow. So all summer long, this thing is getting longer and longer, and the tip is softwood. The base is semi-hardwood, and halfway along that stem, well, that's halfway in between those two. I like using these kind of growths for making cuttings because in most cases, I don't know how old the wood should be to give me the highest rate of success. So if I have a stem like this, I will cut it into different sections. So I have some softwood and some semi-hardwood and some in between, and then I'll see which one of these root the best. By having some of each, I have the highest chance of actually ending up with a rooted cutting. So how do you take these cuttings? Well, generally you take one section that has a node at the bottom and a node at the top. And the node is the point where the leaves attach. So here in this picture, you can see on the left side is a, is a larger branch. 
and we've taken the center part out and that's our cutting. The picture on the right is the cutting we're going to use. You can see there is a note at the top and a note at the bottom. When we do cuttings, we typically discard the very tip of these branches. Those tips have buds that are already starting to grow and we don't want bud growth. We want to grow roots first. That top part is usually not very good for making cuttings. Now I'm going to show you how I actually take these cuttings and how I pot them up. I've gone out in the garden and collected some cuttings. The best time to collect these are early in the morning. And what I like to do is go in the garden, get the cutting, bring them back to my propagation area and do the cutting right away. You don't want these things sitting around because they lose a lot of moisture through their leaves, especially in midsummer. And that will just dry out the cutting. If I'm doing three like this, I probably would go to the garden, get this one, which is a hydrangea, do that cutting, then go back in the garden and get the next one and do that cutting and so on. Now, if you're doing the cuttings in one spot, perhaps at someone else's garden and you need to bring them back to your place to process them, then take these and put them in a plastic bag with a moist paper towel. Try to keep them cool and then you can process them later. As long as you keep the moisture high, there's not a great rush to get them processed. The key is don't let them dry out. Now here we have a cutting from my U, and I also decided to take this one, which is uh, Hemimelis Arnold Promise. Let's first talk about making the cutting. If we have a look at this stem, we have a leaf node here, another leaf node here, another one up here. Then we have a section in here called the internode section. Some cuttings will root along this part of the stem, but the place that is easiest to root is at a node. So when we cut these, I always assume that we're going to get most of the roots right here. So what I do is I make a diagonal cut at the bottom. It's just a habit of mine. It's a good idea to cut the bottom and top differently so you always know which way is up. Now in this case, you've got leaves and you can probably tell that it goes this way and not this way. But with hardwood cuttings, the leaves are gone and it's very easy to flip them around. So it's a good habit to get into. I cut the bottom on an angle. So it's like a shovel. It's easier to push into the soil. And then I move up one node from this cut in, on most shrubs. And then I make a flat cut. I take all the leaves off at the bottom. I take all the leaves off except one at the top. Now, if that leaf is really large, I sometimes cut it in half. The science shows that it really doesn't matter whether you cut them in half or not. You'll see in a few minutes why in my system small leaves will work better. So that's your finished cutting. Now what I generally do is take several cuttings up the stem. So this one, because it was at the bottom, is getting fairly woody. It's certainly a semi-hard wood. But as I move up this stem, they get softer and softer and the tip is still growing. So up here we have a softwood cutting. By taking several cuttings up the stem, I have a variety of ages of wood. And this one might root better with a semi-hard wood or maybe a softer wood. And I don't know that, but by having a variety, I have a better chance of getting a rooted cutting. Now I could make the next cut here and hope that it roots down here. And that will work on many shrubs, but you have a better chance of getting roots if you cut here and discard this piece. So that's my preferred method. The very tip usually won't root very well, so you want to get rid of that. So there's enough wood here for one more cutting. Normally, I would process those right away, get them in the pot. But for the purpose of the video, I'm going to make several different types of cuttings here. Now, if you look at the U, this year's growth is here and it's a light green. This is last year's growth. Now, I know U's grow quite easy from this fresh growth. So what I really want is to cut those off. Now I could use this as well. The U's are so easy to root. You can take a piece from almost anywhere on the stem and it's going to root. But these will root a little easier than this. Now if I'm going to use this piece, I have side branches. Those all have to come off. This has a very congested top here, so I'll cut most of that off. 
but I'll leave a few of the leaves. Now in the hydrangea case, I only left one leaf at the top, but with some like a U, the leaves are so small that I actually leave several. So that's a good size cutting. To root the top parts, I cut the top off because the top is, is ready to grow and I don't want this to grow until it makes root. So I cut that off and grab the top, strip the rest off, and there's your cutting. Now with the hemimelis, what we have is this is actually last year's growth. And then it's made some side branches. So I'll cut the side branch off and I'm going to use it for my cuttings. Same process, diagonal cut at the bottom, pull these side branches off. I don't want to use the top, so I'll cut that off. It's kind of a crummy leaf, but it will do. And there's my cutting. I like to make the cuttings about this big. If they're too small, there isn't enough wood and they're harder to handle. If they're too tall, they don't really fit into my little greenhouse, which you'll see in a minute. That's just the perfect size. All right, so now you've got your cuttings. Now this is the way I usually do the cuttings, but there are a couple things that you could do at this point. Some plants root better if this bottom part is damaged a bit. So you can take your secateurs and just scrape the bark and it might root all along this cut section. Now that may or may not work, doesn't hurt to do that though. The next step is to put some rooting hormone on these cuttings. Now if you go on the internet, there's all kinds of nonsense about home remedies that you can use. Uh, honey is a very popular one. Honey does not contain rooting hormone. It is antifungal, so it might prevent fungus from growing on your cutting, but it doesn't really help the plant to root. Almost all the other things you see online are also nonsense. The one thing that might work is willow extract. But to be honest, a bottle of rooting hormone like this doesn't cost very much. It's going to last you years and years. So why not just get the proper stuff? Rooting hormone comes in usually three different numbers, a one, two, and a three. Those numbers represent how much rooting hormone is in the material. For softwood cuttings and perennials, you typically use a one or two. For, for shrubs and woody plants, you usually use a number three. Okay, so let's say you bought a number three and now you want to do perennial. Well, the difference is just the amount of rooting hormone in this material, so just use a little less. If you use a number three, but you put less on the cutting, it's the same as a number one. So you don't need to buy all three. Now the proper way to use this is to take this, put a little bit of rooting hormone on another dish, use that and then discard that. You never want to put a cutting in here because you might transfer some disease into here. And then the next time you do cuttings, you're going to transfer the disease from here onto your new cutting. I don't do that. I've never seen disease being transferred with cuttings. And since I only do a few, I just do it like this. That's so much easier. Now, if I was a nursery, I'd be much more careful. Now, you might have noticed that I shake it and bang it against the side to, when I'm pulling it out. So dip it in, roll it around, and then shake the excess off. The reason is that if you have too much powder on here, too much of the hormone, it can prevent rooting. So you only want a little bit of dusting on here. The next step is to actually put it in a pot. The material in here is not that important. For years, I just used garden soil. A few years ago, I switched to peat moss with some perlite in it. And I find that I get a bigger root system. I now use this exclusively for all my cuttings. The key is to have something that's very porous, very airy. So peat moss works, great perlite works, is vermiculite. Coarse sand would work. Mixtures of any of those would work. And now it's just a matter of sticking them in here. I usually put five or six in a pot. Stick them in so that it's almost to the top leaf. And now comes the little greenhouse. Any container will work that's clear and that is large enough. I like this one because it has a nice top that I can take off towards the end of the process and let a little more air in here, which will reduce the humidity level around the plants. Get them ready to bring them out into the garden. And here we have a little greenhouse. So what I normally do is water this, put the greenhouse on and put it in a shady area. Now, the next time this needs water, I just water from the top. You can just take your hose and let the water run over the jar in here. You don't have to take this off each time you water. Now you have your cutting sitting there. What happens next? 
Well, I let this sit in the shade for two to three months. Maybe every three weeks, I'll come along and just have a quick look to see what's going on. Take the top off, pull out any weeds that are growing, have a look at the plants. What I want to see is green leaves here. That's a really good sign. Now, if the leaves have gone brown or they've gone moldy, that may be a bad sign, but not necessarily. Take out any leaves that are moldy. We don't want mold to grow in this greenhouse. The cuttings may still root for you, but the longer the leaves are green, the better that is. Now, the other thing that happens is that these cuttings have dormant buds in here, right between the main stem and the leaf. There's a dormant bud, and that dormant bud wants to grow, but we don't want it to grow. We want it to make roots. Inside the plant, both of these are trying to take place at the same time. If the bud starts growing before there's roots, the cutting will probably die. It just takes too much energy and moisture out of this cutting, and there isn't enough left for the roots to develop. A new growth coming out of here is actually a bad sign. Now, if I see that, I sometimes pull it off. I'm not sure if that really makes a difference, but I hope it does. You don't want to see any new growth until you have a good root system, and that can take a couple months depending on the plant. Some root very quickly, some will sit here for a month or two and do nothing and then start making roots. So it's quite variable and it probably also depends on the temperature. Now how do you know when you have roots? Well the common advice is to take your cutting and give it a bit of a tug. Once pulling on this is quite solid, you can be pretty sure you have roots. A really good sign of roots is when the cutting sits like this for two months and then you see new growth starting here. That almost always means that you have a good root system. Let's have a look at a couple of my cuttings that I started about six weeks ago. This is a lilac sensation. It's a French hybrid lilac. These are a little tricky to do, but provided you take the cuttings at the right time, you will have success with these. If we have a look at these, nice green leaves, that's a great sign. Now this one over here has the leaf and the bud started to grow. So we don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Six weeks into it, I'd prefer not to see this yet. You can see that these others don't have growth yet. Now I can tug on these and I don't really feel a lot of resistance, but perhaps a little bit. The best way to really check these is to dump them out. So here's a cutting, not much happening. This one, we have some success, a nice root system. And you can see all the roots are coming out right at the bottom where I made the cut. They're not actually coming out where the node was, they're coming out where the cut was. So this new growth is starting because it's got a decent root system. This one has nothing, it's lost its top leaf. It's going very brown. They'll go brown and soft as they're dying. So that's garbage. Nothing, nothing. Here's another important point about doing cutting. You're not likely to get 100% success rate. I like to do four or five cuttings in each pot and I hope I get two. With some things like the ewes for instance, I know that I'll get almost 100% rooting. They're really easy to do. With other things about 50%, I consider that a success rate. And quite honestly, since I'm a gardener, I only want one of these anyways. So if I have one out of five rooting, I'm happy. If I get two, I'll have one for me and one for a friend. All right, now what do I do? I will pot this one up so it starts growing outside of this greenhouse. The root system's large enough for its own pot. These guys, I'll just put back in the pot and let them sit for a little longer. It's only the first of August here, and so they still might root before the fall. This is also a lilac, but it's a Korean lilac, Mrs. Kim. These are much easier to root than the French lilacs. Again, I look at the leaves. This one's starting to go partially brown, but there's still lots of green. That's a good sign. The leaves actually look very healthy on these. I don't see any new growth. That's a good sign. If I tug on these, I can actually feel these are pretty solid in here. That one at least. That one's not. Oh, there's a little bit there, but I like to dump them out. We have a root system on that one, nice root system there, nice root system on that one. This one is just starting. You probably won't be able to see it. It's like a quarter inch long, that one root. 
All right, so what do I do with this? Well, it really depends on how many of these you want. If you only want a couple of them, you've got five really good ones here that are all rooted. You could pot those up and away you go. These two with the really tiny roots, I would put back in here and leave them for another month. In a month, they'll look like this. This one that hasn't rooted probably will, so I'll probably put that one back. Here's the French lilac cutting that you just seen. Remember it had some roots and it had a shoot starting to grow at the top. So now I've potted it up. I'll keep it watered. I'll keep the dome off of it now. I want it exposed to normal humidity. And this plant's ready to grow. In a couple years, they'll flower for me. Here's a cutting from Daphne Carol Mackey. This is a beautiful plant that has this nice variegated leaf. This is sitting in a one gallon pot and the cutting is probably about a year and a half old. When I take these cuttings, I do leave them a little longer and I leave several leaves on them. The reason for that is that this plant is quite slow growing. If I took really tiny cuttings, then it would take forever for me to get a good sized plant. And so I take larger cuttings. So in a couple years, I've got something that's half decent looking. It's still going to take three, four or five years before it's going to be a nice clump in the garden, but at least it's on the way and it looks really healthy there. This is the parent that it came from. It's a very large shrub and it's actually now too large for that space. And the center branches have actually split. So it's not a very healthy plant. And that's why I'm propagating it. I'm going to get some new ones growing. And when they get a little larger, I'm going to take this parent and just dig it out and get rid of it and replace it with one of the baby plants. Here's my propagation area. We're facing south. So this is the north side of the shed. Doesn't get a lot of direct sun, but it gets a little bit very early in the morning. Just enough for these cuttings. The hose is right there, so it's very easy to water them. And those other things sitting around... Well, there are a variety of different things. Some of them are divisions of plants. Some are older cuttings. Some are seedlings. It's just a good spot to keep everything because it's fairly shaded here. And this is a close-up of my little greenhouses. Very easy to take care of. Now let's talk about this magical stuff called rooting hormone. The first thing to know is that many things will root without rooting hormone. You don't need to go out and buy this. But there are some things that are tough to root and the rooting hormone really helps to move along. So what is this? Well, this is actually a chemical that plants make themselves. Now, the one in the container is very similar to the natural version. But plants make this oxen chemical. And that's what triggers their own root growth. So what we're doing is increasing the amount of natural hormone hormone this plant has and therefore it makes roots more quickly and there's a higher chance that it actually makes roots in the first place. It is available as a powder or liquid. I prefer the powder because it lasts longer. In the dry state it's very stable and this thing lasts for at least 10 years. The liquids are less stable and are only good for a few years. And as amateur gardeners, we just don't use enough of this to warrant buying the liquids. These hormone products tend to come in different concentration levels. So herbaceous plants and softwood cuttings need less hormone. They want a lower concentration of woody plants, on the other hand, want a higher concentration of hormone. So some manufacturers provide these in different concentrations. And I use a product called Stimroot, and it comes as a number one, number two, and number three. A number one is for softwood, herbaceous plants. Number two is for semi-hardwood, and number three for hardwood. Now, you don't need to buy all three of those. What I do is I buy a number three, and if I'm doing one of the other cuttings, I just put less on. And that will also give you lower concentration. So just buy a number three and use that. Too much of this hormone will prevent rooting. So let's go back to this picture here. There's actually four different plants here. And this is taken out of a research paper where they're looking at rooting roses and using different concentrations of the rooting hormone. Now here they're calling it IBA, which is the actual name of the compound. So the one on the left has no rooting hormone and you can see that it's growing, it has roots, but the root system is quite small. B and C, the two in the middle, have pretty good root systems, but the one on the right 
That's the one with the highest concentration of hormone actually has a smaller root system. So this is a case where more is not better. It's really important not to put too much on because it can actually prevent rooting. That's why in the video you've seen, I actually knock off the excess. You don't need the hormone. The right amount is great and too much will prevent roots from growing. Now, if you're surfing around the internet, you've probably seen a number of DIY hormones. There's lots of talk about various things that you can use. I mean, you don't have to go and buy the right stuff. You can just use stuff out of the kitchen. So the picture here shows a very popular YouTube video where they promote the idea of using aspirin. And you dissolve that up and you put a little bit of that on your stems and wow, they just root like crazy. Well, aspirins don't work. There's no rooting hormone in aspirin. Now it turns out that the active ingredient in aspirins is somewhat similar to a rooting hormone and it does have some hormonal activities in plants, but it doesn't cause rooting and cuttings. So it's a complete myth. I'm not sure why people use vinegar. It doesn't do anything for plants. Now the first couple on there, the honey and cinnamon, they don't have any rooting hormones either. But both of those do have antifungal activity. So they prevent the fungus from growing. Now to be honest with you, I've never really had a fungus problem in my cuttings if they root. So when I do cuttings, I do find that some of them just don't root and those eventually will get fungus on them. The ones that root don't have a fungal problem. And I think people have seen that and they have come to the conclusion that the fungus is preventing the rooting. And I don't think that's true. I think what happens is that when the plant can't root, it just starts rotting. I mean, it's not growing anymore. And eventually the fungus take over. So the fungus is not causing the plant to die. It's just using a plant that died anyways. So honey and cinnamon may help a little bit, but it's not going to cause the plants to root. You want a rooting hormone for that. Now the third one on that list is spit on them. I don't know what that's supposed to do, but some people claim that works really well. The middle one there does actually work to some extent. So willow water. You take some willow branches and leaves and you make a concoction, you let it sit, and you get some extracts from the willow in your water. And it turns out that willows root very easily. And one of the reasons they do that is that they naturally have a lot of rooting hormone inside of them. So by making this willow water, you're actually extracting the hormone into the water. And so it may help with rooting. The problem is that you don't know how much you've actually extracted. Remember, the concentration of hormone is critical here. I'm going to guess that you extract very low concentrations and that they're really not helping a lot for your cuttings. I think the people who report success here have success because those cuttings would have rooted in plain water just as well as in willow water. There are also some other myths that I find on the internet and some of these just don't make any sense at all. Here's one of the funniest one that's been around for several years now. You take your cutting and for some reason they always use roses. Take your cutting, stick it in a potato and wait. And what happens? Well, the rose makes roots and starts to grow and the potato grows and gives you potatoes. You get both roses and potatoes out of the same pot. Well, that's not what happens. The potato does absolutely nothing to help your rose root. In most cases, what happens here is that the rose stem rots and the potato may grow and grow potatoes. This is a dumb idea. If you see these kind of things on the internet, just ignore them. This is not how you root cuttings. All right, if you want to get in touch with me, my handle is Garden Fundamentals. I have a YouTube channel, a blog, and a Facebook group and you're welcome to join all of those. If you go to my YouTube channel called Garden Fundamentals, you'll find all kinds of videos about plant propagation, growing things from seed and transplanting and dividing plants and moving shrubs, all kinds of things about propagation.